wow okay that was that's a lot guys and i'm honestly so serious about me trying to be out go out there and be an entrepreneur um so next up we have someone that i have been very fortunate to personally know and to have been in the audience uh, throughout a couple of her presentations so i know she's about to serve honey okay that's the truth uh we have shika shika is a software engineer at zendesk at work she spends a lot of her time scratching her head and declaring unexpected behavior to be weird and loves figuring it out uh, and the reason for this weirdness her current engineering obsession is distributed systems a topic that is broad enough that she anticipates spending years indulging this obsession her current topic of focus is individual service design and the trade-offs that have to be considering considering that service both on its own and as part of a greater system such a mouthful how do you even know what you're doing you know what? i'm just gonna give it over to you Sheikha, and help me i understand what i've just had to say about you <laughs> oh thank you thank you ck um thanks ck that was an amazing introduction as always um, let me just share my screen here. Oh, one second, here we go. Okay, so um, I um, I am Shika. Uh, I am a senior software engineer on the mobile shared services team at Zendesk. Um, and that's a very, very a mouthful of a introduction. Um, but we're here today, as you might know or might have inferred from the title of this talk, to talk about microservices. So um, this kind of complicated introduction is to give you a bit of context into um, what the company I work for does um, and what the team I work on does um, so that I can just better explain what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, and all of that sort of stuff. So um, let's break down what this is for uh, anyone. Are people here aware, first of all, of what shared services teams are? Um, you can just put it in the, in the chat, yes or no. Um, and if you are, then I will skip a couple of slides <laughs> or a slide or not. Okay, um, I'm going to assume that's a no. So, um, so let's go to the next slide. So, what is shared services? Um, you would think something that's shared, a service that's shared between teams. Um, that's yes, in a nutshell, but that also doesn't really um, explain an awful lot. Um, so I work on the mobile shared services team, which implies that I work with mobile teams. Um, I'm going to explain in a second what Zendesk does. All you need to know for the moment is that our customers are other businesses and other companies. Um, so Zendesk has two kind of genres of mobile teams. We have the mobile SDKs um, and we have the mobile apps. So the mobile apps are the Zendesk apps that are available from the App Store or the Google Play Store. The SDKs are software development kits, uh, so pieces of code that we provide that our customers can integrate into their own apps so that they can use Zendesk features um, from their, their own product without having to leave it. And then in the middle there, you have a bunch of responsibilities um, that my team is uh, in charge of. And these are features, uh, services, uh, functionality that we provide to the rest of mobile and that's shared between the SDK teams and the mobile app team. Uh, various, in various um, degrees. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about them, especially APIs and stuff, because we'll talk about that a bit later as well. Um, but APIs are part of what we provide. We provide authentication services, and we also provide uh, push notification alerts um, to the mobile teams. Um, okay, next one. So what is Zendesk? Um, 
Zendesk is, <laughs> I took this very shamelessly, took this blob straight from our uh, website, Barbatum. Um, Zendesk, basically, we provide customer service solutions to other companies. So you can see on the right there um, some of our customers. And basically what happens is, um, say, for example, you're phoning in for customer support. Instead of reaching a call center, um, if, you're, if that company is using uh, Zendesk Talk product, then you're reaching a customer support agent sitting at a computer um, and who will answer your call and provide the support you need. Um, that same agent could also be looking at support requests that come in through integrations like Facebook and WhatsApp and Twitter. Um, they could also be looking at requests that come in just via contact us forms or email. Um, and they could also be looking uh, at live chat and handling, handling customer support that way. So depending on what kind of package or plan they have with Zendesk, they could be using all of these um, or some of these. So, um, uh, oh, and to bring the mobile part into it before I forget, Rovio, uh, who some of you uh, might be aware, makes the Angry Bird game. They are very heavy users of the Zendesk SDK. So they embed the SDK into their games. And then if you're playing it and you need help, um, I know one of the products they use is the Knowledge Base product, which provides articles. So from the game, you can look up um, help center articles to provide you with whatever support you need without having to leave the game. Um, so next one. So we're here though to talk about microservices, <laughs> not to listen to me do the, the company spiel. So um, what are microservices? Um, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a trendy word, I feel like sometimes. Even though they've been around for a while um, and they're not really a new concept, it's still a word that people throw out. Um, and sometimes it feels like it's this paradigm of engineering design that you have to aspire to, um, uh, like it's an end goal. But actually what it is, is it's just one way of doing things. Um, it happens to be a way that suits a lot of companies and that makes a lot of sense, but it's just one way of doing things. Um, and depending on what your needs are, it might not even necessarily be the correct way. Um, and before I continue, I also want to say, if you guys have questions, um, or if you all have questions, sorry, uh, inclusive language here, if you all have questions um, at any point, feel free to pop it in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on it. But uh, we'll probably have some time at the end as well. So whatever you feel more comfortable. Uh, with. So we'll go over um, a bit of what microservices are, um, why you should use them, why not to use them, um, why did my team have to build one, and um, most importantly, um, why am I using cat analogies? What does nine lives have to do with it? Um, why is the analogy when you can use a cat gif? Um, and I will say right now <laughs> that I will take any and every opportunity to use GIFs wherever possible. Um, so, microservices. Um, I want to I want to disclaim that I am far from an expert on microservice architecture, and that's kind of one of the points of this talk. Um, more than once in my career, I have found myself in the situation where I've had to build a thing either using a technology I don't know anything about um, or centered around a design paradigm or an architecture I knew nothing about and had to do this with very little to almost no oversight from an experienced engineer. Um, as it sounds, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Um, and this is where the nine lives idea kind of ties in. I've made a lot of, a lot of mistakes, lost a lot of lives. Uh, my team has made a lot of mistakes. Being thrown into the deep end um, of something and just kind of having to sink a swarm is not my preferred way of learning. I don't know if it's anyone's preferred way of learning, but I did learn a lot. Um, that part can't be denied. 
So um, while I've been loving, I hope uh, you've had some time to look at the um, quote on the screen. Um, the quote this article was taken from was, or the article <laughs> this quote was taken from, sorry, was written in 2014, um, but it still, uh, it still stands true today. So uh, the key part of this definition is independently deployable. So microservice architecture is a way of designing software applications as feats of independently deployable services. Um, does anyone want to hazard a guess at what we mean by independently deployable? You can pop it in the chat again. Basically, uh, what, we're, what we're talking about when we say that is if, you, if you're using a microservice architecture um, in your system, you can make changes to a service and you can send those changes out to users, out to uh, production systems without affecting any other parts of your application or your system. Um, and this is in direct contrast with um, monoliths, which is the antithesis of microservices, which is where everybody is contributing to one place. And we'll see how uh, this differs in a moment. So, as we said, microservice architecture happens when your system is comprised of a series of independent services. Um, so, what are some characteristics each of these services might have? One is uh, communication usually happens over a network. So usually via um, a web request or some kind of remote procedure call. Um, tied in with this is that a service defines an explicit interface, uh, for example, an API. Um, for you might already know about uh, APIs, and I'm sorry if I'm being a little patronizing here with the do you know this, do you know that questions. Um, I didn't I didn't study computer science or any uh, software engineering related degree uh, in university. I studied uh, genetics and then kind of self-taught. So um, funny story was uh, when I started at Zendesk five years ago, my first task was to build a new API. <laughs> and my first question was, what's an API? <laughs> so um, if I am being patronizing, I apologize. Um, I'm just trying to make sure uh, there's as much context as possible here. Um, and again, please feel free, if I'm going too fast or too slowly, feel, feel free to pop it into the chat and um, we can take it from there. So, um, yes, yeah, so each service defines an uh, explicit interface like an API. Um, for those of you who don't know, an API might be something like, uh, an API is an interface that other applications um, or other services use to pull data or to pull functionality from your service or your application. Um, an obvious example that is used literally everywhere in the internet is, um, Facebook exposes an API to log in with Facebook. Um, another example is that um, Instagram on iOS uses the Apple Music API to add music to uh, Instagram stories and reels. So, so, so that's how um, you share you share features between Instagram and Apple Music, between Facebook and other web applications, and even other mobile applications. Um, services are also usually built around a product that the company offers, as opposed to being undertaken as a project with a definite start and end date. Um, so product-centric design means that the work continues on for as long as the company offers that product. Um, so the team doesn't just build something and then move on to the next thing. They're also responsible for maintenance and upkeep of the service they're in charge of. Um, by decentralized governance and data management, what we mean is that there isn't uh, one centralized or specific set of rules regarding how a service should uh, behave, like how it should be designed, what frameworks it should use. Um, each, each one, each new service can be, can use different frameworks, can use 
different structures um, and with the data management uh, by textbook definition of microservices, each new service uh, should have its own database and its own data store. So um, you don't have to worry too much about consistency or keeping in line with what other, other services are using. Um, and we'll come back to this concept again uh, later on in this talk. Um, you should, and design, designing for failure. This is, this is a huge one. Um, services can fail and will fail at any time for many, many reasons. And when designing, it's important to remember this and to put necessary fallbacks in place. Um, we're definitely going to talk about this one later. So that's all I'm going to say on it for now. But uh, just to call out explicitly that this is far from an exhaustive list. Um, it's not even a super great summary. Service design is hugely, it's a hugely broad and complex topic. Um, you could go do three day, four day workshops on it. So all I've done here is just touched on a few aspects that will give you some insight into high level considerations when thinking about services. And I will also provide some context uh, for what we'll talk about a little later. So what are some of the advantages of um, microservices? Well, one is that it helps align organization with the architecture of your system. And by that, we mean if you have a monolith, so if you have one code base with multiple teams working on it, um, then there's a few organizational challenges that you might be facing. Uh, for example, when it comes to deploying changes, whose work is higher priority, who goes first, um, who's responsible for maintaining certain parts of the code base, um, Often the work teams are doing will impact each other. And if those teams are in different geographical locations, then that can be challenging to work around. Um, also, so, so microservice architecture gives teams a bit more ownership over their work and it streamlines the development process. And it also kind of mimics the um, structure of the organization. If you have one team that's in charge or if you have um, a product manager for the specific product, then you also have a team for that specific product. Um, and if you have product managers for another product, you have a team for that other product. So you're kind of mimicking your organizational structure with um, the architecture of your system. With a monolith, um, small changes are discouraged, discouraged because of the repercussion of those changes. Um, even if you have, even if you're just making a one line change, you'll probably need to run the tests for the entire code base because you're not sure which ones are applicable. And then when it comes to deploying those changes, you have to deploy the entire application, which carries quite a high degree of risk. Um, so then changes tend to be batched together. And uh, even when you're taking them out as a batch, that's also incredibly risky because of the number of changes. So with monoliths, um, change tends to be slow and very risky. With a microservice architecture, you've got, um, a, but like teams have a lot more autonomy to, to make changes. So they can make small changes and they can ship them uh, faster and easier and more safely because there's less risk of, um, there's less risk of having knock on effects. They're also more cost effective. Um, large services, depending on your stack and what third party vendors you're using, the larger your service is, um, the more it's going to cost to run and the more it's going to cost to get more resources. Um, again, depending on your stack and your structure, it could be cheaper to have a large number of smaller services as opposed to a small number of large ones. Um, and having a microservice architecture could also help you scale more economically. If you have a monolith, then you have no choice but to put kind of one gate or one perimeter around everything. Um, it's kind of like your application is this castle with a huge moat around it, and it's just one entryway for everything. With services, you can, you, you'll probably have some services that have more sensitive data than others. So you might have an accounts and a billing service, and you can segregate those into separate network uh, segments and 
put them under, give them additional protections, usually at multiple levels. Um, and then those other services with less, um, less sensitive data can have less restrictions on it. And this kind of ties into the cost effectiveness um, because if you're, if you're a small company and if you're um, relying on third party vendors, even if you're a large company and you're relying on third party vendors uh, to help with some of your security concerns, um, then you know, depending on what their pricing plan is uh, and how you're using it, only having to apply it to small parts of your um, of your overall system could be cheaper and more economic. Um, and as we touched on with the uh, decentralized governance top uh, point, you can adapt technologies, new technologies easier with a microservice architecture. Um, when you have a monolith, consistency is key. So you're constrained in the number of technologies you can adapt, adopt, um, and usually the, the, the monolith will have one database as well. Um, since services are deployed and managed independently of each other, in theory, you're going to have different databases and you could have different programming languages, different deployment platforms, different continuous integration, um, uh, and so forth, uh, depending on what your service needs or what one suits your service the best. In reality, I'm going to caveat this. Um, in reality, this is constrained by the costs of maintaining different technologies. Um, there's also reliability concerns and other operational concerns, but services do provide a lot more flexibility and a lot of options when it comes to stack choice. Um, when I joined Zendesk um, in 2016, teams were free to choose whatever um, framework they wanted, whatever language they wanted. Um, there was a bit of a review process around it, but not much. Um, five years on, it's become uh, to the point where, because it's expensive to have to maintain so many different languages, we have something called a tech menu. So we have a list of uh, pre-approved languages, a list of pre-approved databases uh, and so forth and so, um, and so forth that you can choose from. And if you have a real need to use something different, then you can um, submit that request for approval and get it added to the tech menu. Um, so that's how we approach and in different, different uh, technologies and frameworks. So what are some of the disadvantages of microservices? Well, um, with the more services you have, the more complex your system might be. Even if you've checked every single box, which is highly unlikely, and even if every service is truly independent, there are still complexity concerns um, from an operational standpoint. The teams that manage your infrastructure or your network concerns, even your site reliability, reliability teams, they have to handle all these different services, their different data stores, their different security concerns, and that comes with a lot of overhead. Um, often, even though services are independent in terms of design, they have to communicate to each other from, with each other from a product perspective. Um, Netflix was one of the, to my knowledge, was one of the first adopters of our microservice architecture. And I don't know exactly how their services are, are designed. Um, that's probably inside information. But if you think about your dashboard, um, you're going to need, you know, accounts information, billing information, those are separate things probably. And then um, what you've watched already, what you have on your watch list, how far your progression is. There's a lot of different things there um, to, to have to think about. So although a service is independent in terms of design, it talks a lot with other services. And if one service fails, then that potentially has a knock-on effect for other services that rely on it. So if you remember, we mentioned earlier that designing for failure was one of the characteristics of services. Depending on what your service does, your ability to fail gracefully will differ. And by that, by fail gracefully, I mean sometimes you can handle a service being down and sometimes you can't. Um, if it's an account service, if it's an authentication service that's down, for example, 
then anything that communicates with it is going to straight up fail as well because you can't do anything without authentic uh, without authentication um we'll come back to this a little bit later but i think i've also seen laura nolan on the list of uh speakers for today and she's going to be talking about cascading failures i think later this evening so um if that's it's a, it's a really interesting topic um it's a really uh, I'll say interesting situation as well to be in as an engineer if you're in this uh, situation where something is down and it's having knock-on effects. Um, so that's a good talk to talk uh, to to go to if you want to know a little bit more about about failures and how to handle them. Um, each team has a broader range of responsibilities. Uh, if your teams are well structured and skilled enough, then this is not a problem. But, or it might not be a problem, but as we'll see soon, this isn't always the case. And then the debate is still open as to when exactly to operate, uh, when exactly to adopt a microservice architecture. Um, the most commonly accepted school of thought is that you should have a well-structured monolith first because you need a lot of domain knowledge that a monolith will give you. You need to know how users will interact with your service um, and that sort of stuff before you start to break it apart. But there's other schools of thought that say um, breaking up a monolith becomes almost impossible once you reach the point where you really need to do it. Um, the, the debate is ideally left to people who have a much broader range of experience, experience with services than I do. Um, mine is just with my team and my company, but my two cents uh, from my experience is that monoliths are indeed very, very, very difficult to break apart. Um, you may have uh, picked up that I said well-structured monoliths a couple of times. Keeping a monolith well-structured depends a lot on engineer discipline and developer discipline and on your company having uh, comprehensive and stringent guidelines, best practices, um, and that sort of stuff. The bigger your company is and the more globally distributed teams are or engineering teams are, the harder this becomes to do. Um, so so the, the, the debate is still open on that. So why did my team need to build a microservice? Um, first off, I want to apologize for the kind of amateurish, untidy uh, little diagrams here. I couldn't really find any gifts or any diagrams that suited my purpose, so I just drew my own. Um, but basically, we had the situation, right? We had a monolith with a lot of APIs, including all the mobile APIs. Um, and if you recall, I mentioned earlier that we have mobile SDKs and mobile apps at Zendesk. So we had this monolith, we had all these APIs, it had mobile APIs, it had um, some account information, it had some billing information, it had some ticket, it had ticket information, it had a lot of uh, different and very important things. And it reached to a point where um, scaling and reliability became very big concerns. The way the SDKs work is that they're embedded in an app as I mentioned earlier. And when the app starts, you make a request to Zendesk for the settings of the Zendesk SDK. And those settings contain things like which features are enabled and which products are enabled, so we know which functionality we can offer in that app. Um, and then you might go through the entire experience of the app, whether it's um, streaming something or ordering food or playing a game without needing any support. But if you need support, but if you do need support, then you're making um, additional requests to Zendesk. We've also had a situation where uh, with a food delivery system in, um, in Central Asia, um, I can't name names about the company, um, but what we think they, they had uh, at one stage been huge, huge consumers of the Zendesk SDK. And we saw um, thousands and thousands and thousands of requests coming in uh, per per day or per hour for from them, and we've never confirmed it. But from analyzing their traffic and how 
the traffic patterns and how things are working, we were fairly certain that they had used Zendesk to build like as their platform for their for their product. So they were a food delivery um, provider. And every time someone li liked Deliveroo, but it wasn't Deliveroo. Um, and every time someone wanted uh, a request for, or put in a request or an order for food, that created a ticket in Zendesk, which is not really a, um, a use case that we're supposed to do. It's supposed to be, you know, when you need customer support. Um, so the SDK APIs had huge volumes of traffic, both from uh, use cases that we hadn't anticipated and also from legitimate use cases as well. And they were in this monolith with a lot of other products. Um, and if the SDKs happened, if resources became constrained, um, then it affected, it had a knock on effect on other products. So for reliability reasons, um, we proposed or we started to float this idea of a new SDK centric service. Um, and we wanted it to be SDK centric for a few reasons. One, because the mobile apps um, had a lot less traffic because of the way they were used. Um, <laughs> thanks, Kira. Uh, the, the mobile apps are used usually by our customers, customer support agents. So they're not uh, as exposed to as many people as the SDKs are. Um, they're also very closely tied to other products of Zendesk. So taking them away, decoupling them from those other products would have been difficult. But with the SDKs, we had a very strong use case to uh, move them into their own service. And we also had a very clear starting point uh, with those settings APIs that I mentioned, because those settings APIs were read only, so we weren't writing to a database. And because they had such high volumes of traffic, we could take them into, the new, uh, into this new service um, and then see how the new service handled them and also see what the impact was on the monolith, how it, um, whether it had the intended relief that we thought it should have. So um, this was the idea. I think I've already kind of come across the side. This was the idea that we built the new um, SDK-centric service and then redirect all the traffic that was previously going to the monolith for SDKs to that new service. And then the end result would be that we have uh, two services, the monolith and this new SDK API service. Um, and maybe the mobile app APIs are still in the monolith, but the SDK APIs are separate to that. And um, the traffic should be should be a lot um, a lot lower on the monolith. And because the SDK API service is only getting SDK traffic, we don't have to worry about what happens if the same thing happens with other products and their resources become constrained and we suffer the knock-on effects of that. So, so the, the ask was build a new service for SDK endpoints, start off with these two settings endpoints that don't need a database, don't need or don't need to do database writes, um, and then you know move traffic to, to that. So it sounds simple in theory, right? It wasn't. It really, really wasn't. Um, so remember when I mentioned before that I've often in my career found myself out of depth tackling a task that feels very, way, way too large um, with no one to, to kind of guide that, that project. Uh, this new SDK API service was one of them. When we started floating the idea, we had one of those well-structured teams that a microservice needs. Um, we had two senior engineers, um, very senior engineers, one of which was a team lead, uh, one of which was the technical lead. Uh, we had an engineering manager who was familiar with shared services teams and the way we worked. Um, there was myself, there was a junior engineer, and there was a test engineer. By the time it came to actually start this project or when this project got approval, the engineering manager had left to a different team. The technical lead had left to a different different team. The our team lead had left the company completely. Um, we had a new temporary team lead who um, was coming from a different domain, so not from a shared services um, background. And it was myself 
and a junior, a junior engineer and a test engineer. Um, and I, at that time, had just been promoted to senior. So um, we'd worked a lot. I had worked a lot with building APIs in existing services and communicating with them. But I had never done a microservice from the ground up from scratch uh, and designing it. Um, and um, we had to do it. So as I said before, we made a lot of mistakes. We learned a lot of lessons. But apart from all the technical knowledge gained, I think the biggest and most important takeaway for me is that when a project doesn't go the way it's planned, it's never the fault of just one person or one team. Um, engineering teams, first and foremost, are that their teams. But even if as a team you don't succeed in your end goal, it's never just your team in silo uh, that had to do this. It usually came from, like the ask would have been in conjunction with product management teams. You would have had upper management of the company that said, this is our roadmap. You probably have design teams, uh, depending on your structure, testing may or may not be a different team. So it's never the fault of just one person or just one team. So. Yeah, so we're going to move on to the nine lives <laughs> or the lessons learned, however you want to look at a part of this. Um, the most important thing I think, and even though this is not a technical lesson, um, identify what is and is not in your control. Um, this is important so that you can know what you personally did well and what you could have done better. When you, um, a mistake I made when we were building the service and we were undergoing all these organizational changes with people leaving and being understaffed was that I assumed it was my responsibility as the senior engineer to now be the team lead and the tech lead and uh, keep up team morale and try and advocate for hiring new people. We were in a hiring freeze at the moment, so replacing the people who left wasn't really happening um, and it became it it, it it became a lot um, so take it from someone who has worked obscene obscene hours of overtime uh, who has had stress breakdowns in front of two different managers um, find out what you can can and cannot control define what is and is not your job to do um, and if it is not your job, punt it over to someone whose job it is to do. Um, don't forget about the bigger picture. And by this, I mean, don't forget about uh, extensibility and how the work you're doing at the moment is going to be used in future and how it can be expanded upon. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we started with two read-only APIs, um, the settings APIs. And under all this confusion that was happening, um, so I'm tying this in with the point above because I feel like um, so much was happening that we weren't really concentrating on what was just our jobs. And because of that, some balls were dropped, including this one. Um, the mistake we made was that we focused so much on these settings endpoints that we forgot about the other SDK endpoints that would theoretically follow these settings endpoints. Um, if you remember, I mentioned earlier about designing for failure and that depending on what your service is doing, your ability to fail gracefully differs. Um, with the settings endpoints, we had a lot of room for failing gracefully uh, because they were, and by that I mean, uh, because the setting endpoints were just settings endpoints, were just that they were for settings. We could, if a service that we, can, we, we relied on was down, so, um, to build these settings endpoints, we had to fetch information from other products to see if they were enabled or not, um, and from other services to get additional data. So if those services were down, we had that ability with settings to just say, uh, to just default the values to false or to empty arrays or those kind of values, because then that would just disable functionality in the SDK app, and that was, that was fine. Um, if a service is down, you don't want to access its functionality, so disabling it was perfectly fine. But we forgot about um, the work that would follow on from these settings endpoints. 
And when it came to putting in new APIs that needed to write to a database, for example, ones that needed to create SDK apps, um, you, can't, you can't default to false values uh, when you're creating an app or when you're updating an app or when you're doing anything that requires a database write. Um, so we ended up having to refactor parts of the application because we kind of lost sight of this work that was to come. Um, and, and that slowed us down in, in other projects that came after the initial design of the service. Um, peer review is absolutely vital. Um, there's many ways this happen. the mo happens. The most common way is by pull requests. Um, are you all familiar with the concept of pull requests? Um, well, there's many ways that uh, peer review happens. Uh, pull requests use something like uh, use a, a, a website called GitHub. You put a piece of code up um, and other engineers review it. Um, awesome. Perfect. Oh, awesome. Yes, I know they can be they can be very stressful to do. Um, but if I have to, they, they can be stressful to do as the person reviewing and they can be even more stressful as the person putting up a PR for review, but it honestly is incredibly vital and so helpful. Um, the work I've done that I'm the most confident about and the most secure about have had the most harrowing PR review processes. And by harrowing, I mean um, there was one PR I put up that uh, for many reasons was reviewed by um, architects and principal engineers at Zendesk. And I think we had about 70 comments on that pull request asking for changes and asking for um, things to be done differently. Why is this done this way? Why is that done another way? Um, and it's it's stressful at the time because you're you're you know you're anxious about how people are perceiving your code. But this is the voice of experience talking. The more questions people are asking you about why you're doing things, the the better your code is going to be. Um, we're we're very close to the problem we're trying to solve. So we tend to get uh, stuck onto one path, and there's always more than one way to do things. Um, with the, the small team that we had when we were building the service, uh, because we were so inexperienced with service design, we used to talk a lot about with each other about what we were doing before we put pull requests up. So we already knew what would be in a PR before it went up for review. And the downside of that was that um, we kind of didn't think, then when a review came up, if I put up a pull request, my teammate already knew what it was going to contain, and we had already agreed on what it was going to contain. So not a lot of thought went into alternative ways of doing things. So PR reviews, absolutely vital. Um, and as a, a tip, if you're interviewing anywhere in the future and you're trying to think of questions that you can ask your interviewer, peer review process is a great one. Um, don't take it for granted that every team and every company does peer reviews. So asking about it is, um, is a good way to uh, gauge the culture um, of a team and of a company. Exactly, exactly. Um, so investigate before committing. So spike wherever needed uh, and wherever possible. And by spike, I mean um, most, most, I think most teams out there now use agile software development processes. Um, I'm assuming so, it seems, it seems that way from looking at, um, you know, just from experience. But even if the team doesn't, um, even if you don't do proper discussion and refinement of, of tasks. Um, <clears throat> you can, this, this is a good practice to do even just personally, even when you have a task to do. Um, even if you kind of think you understand what needs to be done, like you have a bug that needs, that needs to be fixed uh, and you think you know where it comes from, throw in code like investigate a little bit, uh, throw in code, see how the system performs, see how the application performs, 
again, uh, gain, gather a bit of knowledge about what would happen if you do different things. Um, try and think of a few different ways of approaching the problem and 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 uh, play around with them, um, and then decide on a way to on a way to uh, solve this or what the best approach might be. Um, this can be further abstracted to if you have the time and if you're doing something that's new to you, start with doing the reading. Um, maybe you've, there'll be times when you get a task and you're like, oh, I saw a great talk about this or I read a great article about this um, some time back. If you have the time, go back and read that article or watch that talk again. Um, if it's something new to you and you have the time, read up on it first um, and do a bit of reading, uh, learning and then and then do a bit of experimenting and then decide on a solution. Requirements will change. Um, and the reason I say this is, well, because it will happen and it will happen constantly, uh, no matter how good your planning process is, no matter how much thought you've put into it, no matter how uh, knowledgeable your team is before doing something, the requirements will change. Um, for us, when we had we had decided that this was going to be an SDK centric service, um, and when we had uh, finished completed the, um, implementing those two settings endpoints, the next APIs that we had to do were new APIs for the mobile apps. So we had the service called the mobile SDK API servers, and we had to add mobile app uh, centered endpoints to it. And um, there, there's many reasons that those didn't go into the monolith, but these these endpoints um, needed to go through security process review, and it was quite a interesting. We made for a few interesting meetings where we were in security review, and they were like, "So are the SDKs using this endpoint?" And we we're like, "No, um, okay, but you're in putting it into the SDK API service, yeah." But it's used by the mobile apps, not the mobile SDKs. Yeah. So uh, requirements will change. Um, all you can really do is roll with it wherever possible. Um, again, it comes back to the identify what is and what is not in your control. When the requirements do change, um, take a deep breath, go back to the design process, go back to assumptions you've made, and figure out um, if they're still valid, if they're still true. Uh, sometimes the requirement change can be a blessing in disguise, sometimes not. Um, I've recently talked to a friend who had to scrap a project that they've been working on for six months because of something they'd missed. So it, it all depends, but um, don't take it as a personal insult. Don't stress too much about it. Uh, just do what you can. Um, and I think that's the key takeaway from all of this is that um, your responsibility is to do the best you can with the knowledge you have and the tools you have available. Um, and as long as you're doing that, then you're, you know, that's all you can do. Um, so that's about it. Um, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I think we might have some time for questions if anyone has any. None so far. I think what's happening, Shika, as it has with the previous speakers, this is what happens. You served, you gave all the information, and now they're just like, you know, trying to take it in, trying to process. How can you ask a question when you're still trying to like, you know, you know, recover from being blown away? I just, I just think it was, it wasn't by far, it wasn't perfect information overload. I know there was a lot um, of stuff. I think it's more yeah. to do with the fact that you were so great. You were keeping it accessible for beginners. I actually wanted to commend you on that. Um, I know you kept asking if you didn't want to sound patronizing, but for the fact of the matter is I have zero, and I really need you to see this, zero, experience and it comes to technology <laughs> but i was able to follow some of what you were saying because of the fact that you were ensuring that our audience whether at the beginning stage or expert stage were able to actually understand what you're doing and able to allowing them to actually get into that um so 
there. Somebody's actually just commented. Everybody's just talking about, you know, how much information you gave me, but they don't have any questions because you really covered everything. Like you said, that's all, folks. And guys, did I lie? Did I lie? Did I not tell you that she would come and serve? Because that's exactly what she just did. <laughs> um, I don't think there's a, any more questions. So, Shika, I'm going to just say thank you so much for educating, for inspiring, for serving, honey. Okay, that's for sure. Um, and for participating um, in this year's system 2021, you have been an invaluable addition onto the speakers that we've had lined up so far. So thank you so much for that. Um, and also thank you for serving like usual. I'm not going to say that. All right. Perfect. Thank you. See you, everyone.